Good evening. I'm David Lair, president of Community Advocates, Inc., one of the co-founders of this America at a Crossroads series of town halls. I welcome you on behalf of my partner, Janice Cameron Resnick, the president of, Community of uh, Jews United for Democracy and Justice, and its executive committee. She's out of town, but has been checking in on our progress. I'll let her know that we have nearly 5,000 registrants who signed up for this evening. Tonight, we host the pundit par excellence, the New York Times' David Brooks. We are in for a real treat. He returns for his fourth appearance with America at a Crossroads this evening with one of our most frequent hosts, Pat Morrison. Next week, we will explore an interesting phenomenon in world affairs the resistance that courageous populations are demonstrating to autocratic regimes. From Iran to Russia to China, we have two world-class experts, Mixon Pei of Claremont McKenna College and Larry Diamond of Stanford University. They'll be in conversation with KPCC's Larry Mantle. The following week, we'll focus on the Middle East and troubling developments there, from the return of Netanyahu to Iran's brazen involvement in European affairs alongside the Russians. Former Ambassador Dennis Ross, one of the world's most experienced diplomats, will be joined by the Israeli Democracy Institute's Yedidia Stern, who'll be joining us live from Jerusalem about one o'clock in the morning there, and they will be talking with KCRW's Warren Alney. Following weeks will bring us Ambassador Michael McFall, foreign policy maven Robin Wright, and Congressman Adam Schiff. Informative programs all. Of course, you'll receive emails notifying you of all of these programs. Now I welcome my good friend, a former member of the LA County Board of Supervisors and the Los Angeles City Council, a pillar of LA politics for decades, Zev Yaroslavsky. He'll introduce tonight's guest and our moderator. Zev? Thank you very much, David. And uh, let me take this opportunity to wish you and our team, and especially our loyal audience, a happy, healthy, and peaceful new year. Uh, tonight, we're honored to have as our guest, one of the most influential commentators on politics, morality, foreign, and domestic affairs, David Brooks. David has been a columnist for the New York Times since 2003. He is a weekly contributor on public broadcast systems, NewsHour, National Public Radio's All Things Considered, and a regular on NBC's Meet the Press. In short, if you care about what's happening in the world and across our nation, and if you follow the news, you are likely to hear or read his salient and nuanced analyses somewhere during the course of the week. David is a voice of reason and thoughtfulness, a man with a firm and discernible moral compass, and we're honored to have him back uh, with uh, America at a Crossroads. He will be interviewed by one of our most frequent moderators, a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist at the Los Angeles Times, Pat Morrison. Pat is a chronicler of Southern California history and current events. She is also an author, television and radio commentator, and she's one of the most revered journalists anywhere. Pat was our last moderator in 2022, and now our first in 2023. And I can't think of anyone better to help us transition from one tumultuous year to the next. And that's Pat Morrison. Pat, it's all yours. Zev, thank you so much. And thanks to all the organizations and sponsors that make a program like this so possible at so difficult and important a juncture in American history. And thank you, David Brooks, for being here. Good to be with you. Welcome to C-SPAN Sweeps Week. <laughs> we, the spectacle continues on Capitol Hill, perhaps another vote tonight, perhaps not, as uh, the House of Representatives is unable to elect a speaker. In, in the 13th century, when the Cardinal, College of Cardinals would not elect a new pope in Viterbo, the locals started sending in only bread and water and eventually took the roof off the, uh, the palace where they were deliberating before they finally chose a pope. We're feeling like we're getting a little bit there, but, but what, what are the, the real machinations going on here? Is this about one man or is this about a movement and really the nature of the house itself? Yeah, we'd have to take away their red meat and then uh, maybe they'd behave. Uh, yeah, I think this I is- I think their phones, let's take away their phones. <laughs> that ought to do it. Uh, this is about nihilism. <laughs> So there has always been a group of Republican members of Congress, not too many, 10 or 15, who basically believe they need to tear the system down. And opposition and recalcitrance and non-cooperation is not the ends, is not the means to get to some end. It is the end. It is what they want. They just are not interested in government. And why you run for Congress not being interested in government is sort of beyond me. But they were, they've been around a different iterations since about 2011. Uh, and John Boehner had to wrestle with them. 
Paul Ryan had to wrestle with them. Uh, and those guys could get elected speaker because they had a bigger majority. Uh, they had larger majorities than what uh, Kevin McCarthy or the Republicans now enjoy. So now because the majority is so slim, uh, they, uh, they have veto power over the speaker. But in my view, it's mostly about their level of nihilism. And, you know, I've, uh, I don't know any of the, the 10 who are really leading this, but I know a lot of people who know them. Uh, and they say quite up front, I just want to tear the system down. Uh, I just don't want to govern. I don't believe we need to govern this thing. We need to tear the whole thing down. And so there's really no appeasing them. And McCarthy has tried to appease them this way and that. And at first, I assumed that McCarthy would get the speakership eventually. But now I, I sort of assume he probably won't. Um, but it almost doesn't matter. Whoever gets it, whether it's Steve Scalise, the number two, or X, Y, or Z, they will have to deal with these 11. And to take that job right now, uh, you just have to be a glutton for punishment. And it will mean that um, the Congress or the House will sort of be non-functional, probably for a couple of years. And that is survivable, except uh, they have to raise the debt ceiling to keep our country uh, basically solvent in world affairs. And um, I, you know, you always assume they're not going to go crazy and do the impossible uh, thing that would really be nationally ruinous. But now there are a lot of people in Capitol Hill who think, um, I don't see how a debt ceiling passes uh, without, uh, you know, the, the Democrats don't want to make compromises with these Republicans. A lot of the Republicans want to see the debt ceiling pass, but these 11 or maybe 20 or 30 do not. Uh, and so that really is the alarm here, that, that it's not only we don't, we have a sort of a shambolic House of Representatives, but we have a government that can't raise the debt ceiling and, and therefore leads to some really bad outcomes. Some of the rules concessions that some of these recalcitrant members have been asking for reminds me of the UN Security Council where one veto can blow up anything, however laudable the rest want to do. Yeah, and you know, it, some of them would be make it very easy to remove the speaker at any time. Uh, and so that's just, um, that just weakens the speaker. And on, you know, on principle, I'm not terribly dis disturbed by that. The, over the course of my time covering Congress, the big thing that's happened year by year, decade by decade, is that power has been taken away from the committees and the committee chairman and the individual members, and it's been concentrated in the leadership, the Speaker of the House, the Minority Leader, uh, in the Senate, the Majority Leader, um, and it's Congress people giving away power. And I always tell them, you know, I was taught in political science class that people run for office because they want power and they want to use power. But members of Congress give away power in large bunches. They're willing to be led by the speaker and do whatever the speaker tells them to do, or they're willing to give power to the, to the White House, to the executive branch. They pass laws that don't really control what the executive branch does. They just say, go do this in some whatever way you want. And so it's been an eye-opening to me that so many politicians run for office and then promptly give away power. It's had a terrible effect on legislation because the old committee system where you had people who knew what they were doing, running the finance committee, running the ways and means committee, that was a sensible, more or less sensible way of running uh, the Congress in the way I think people wanted the Congress to run. But now the committees are way less powerful and all power is concentrated in about four or five people who run the whole place. Uh, Dan Crenshaw, the Republican from Texas, the guy with the eye patch, was talking about infighting. He said it makes us the Republicans look foolish, but didn't know any better. It's like the Democrats paid these people off. Let's make it look like the Republicans can't govern and don't deserve any gavels. Is is this a clarifying moment for Republicans, or are old line Republicans just washing their hands of this and saying, "Let's, you know, we're we're not going to get into this because it can only drag us down. We have to wait and see who survives this nuclear conflict." One of the things I've learned in the last four years is that majorities don't rule, minorities rule often. And it's often the angriest, loudest, most intimidating people in a congregation, in a school, uh, and I guess in a Congress who run things. And a lot of the sensible people just keep their head low. I have a friend who's a pastor, and he says the spiritually healthy people uh, in my church don't make the noise. The spiritually unhealthy people make the noise. And the spiritually healthy people are just trying to keep their heads down. And that's sort of what's happening in Congress right now. And my hope is that a lot of uh, a lot of what's happening in the Republican Party, my hope, and I think, 
is what you might call the great divorce, that the, the relationship they had with Donald Trump has undergone a series of weakenings, uh, most notably with um, the January 6th stuff, most notably with the disaster, relative disaster of the midterms. And now maybe this um, episode is reminding people that you can't just let craziness take over your party. Uh, and you have to really elect normal human beings. And when Marjorie Taylor Greene is on the side of the rational, uh, then you've really gone a long way over to weirdness. Uh, maybe they're grading rational on the curve. Yeah, <laughs> it's just... Um, you, you alluded to this, but what are the domestic consequences if Congress can't get its act together and get things done? Something like the debt ceiling, but who knows what else? I mean, I know they want Hunter Biden hearings, but there's a lot of mechanics of the work of the people that has to be done. Yeah, you would think, and, and I have to say, we, we were all down on Congress, but the last Congress, the, the one that ended, or maybe ending, if, if we ever get a next Congress, um, it was actually quite productive. Uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, bipartisan chips, the, the software bill, they had some gun legislation, uh, they passed uh, in early in the Congress some of the COVID relief, and so it was a pretty good Congress. By any stretch of productivity, they got a lot done. And there's a thing which people call the secret Congress, which is all the little pieces of legislation that go under the, don't get covered much in the media, but where things actually do get done. And so we think they're all at loggerheads, it's all dysfunctional, it's all gridlock. But over the last two years, that has not been the case. And so I happen to think a lot of things that got passed are, are just tremendously good for America. I think the infrastructure bill will send a lot of money, not only to green energy, but also to basically working class men and women who, who will get jobs building infrastructure. And to not be able to solve your problems uh, is, uh, is just bad for and disastrous for a country, especially long term. I've been obsessing the way many people have over the last couple of weeks about artificial intelligence and chat GPT. Uh, and you see technology moving so fast. And you see government moving so slow, or about to move slowly, apparently. And it's just, um, you just think we can't uh, keep up with the world around us. Um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, briefly the Democrats, and they certainly voted in lockstep for Hakeem Jeffries. Um, but the Democrats are not without some dissension themselves. Today, we saw Joe Biden join Mitch McConnell at a site where a bridge is going to be reinforced, rebuilt an important bridge between Ohio and Kentucky, Mitch McConnell state. And Biden was talking about working together with people like Mitch McConnell, with whom he has profound political ideological disagreements. And, and there's a lot of eye rolling and some new members, more progressive liberal members of Congress about that kind of cooperation, which you would expect to see and did see on the other side of the aisle as well. So how are Democrats going to configure themselves in all of this? You know, both parties have their wings that are, are not about compromise, not about politics, just the, their theory is that force matters. And you just use force and somehow you'll get your way. The Republican Party's version of that is way bigger and way crazier, in my view. But there is a belief on some people in the Democratic Party that what they call the base mobilization strategy will work. We don't have to move to the center. We just need to go further left. And then young people or name your group will come out and vote for us and we'll win elections. Uh, I think there's been almost no evidence to support that. And the lesson of the 2022 election was that uh, what they call the median voter theory matters. If you get to the median voter to the middle of the country, then you end up winning. And the Democrats successfully got to the middle uh, this term. And I have to say, uh, there's dissension of the Democrats. The Democrats are the Democrats. They're going to they're gonna fight amongst themselves. So a friend of mine um, once said he, he was raising money on, polit on a political issue that wasn't necessarily partisan. And he got some money from Republican donors and he got some money from Democratic donors. And he said, you know, I much prefer getting money from Republican voters. They, they just say, um, you know, you know your job. Here's the money. Do whatever you think is right. The Democratic donors say, here's the money. Let me tell you how you should do your job. And so he found them much more annoying. Um, I don't know if that's a fair generalization, but it brings a little true to me. Um, but the Democrats and progressives in particular over the last two years uh, did quite a good job of being you stating their case, but being reasonable. They could have really thrown a monkey wrench in the uh, lots of bills that, you know, the infrastructure bill got scaled way back. Um, 
And yet they, the progressives were pretty practical. It's like, we're not going to get what we want, but let's, let's do what we can and get what we can. And so, you know, I just looked at the 2022 election and I saw one party that was not going for the median voter, the Republicans, and the Democrats doing a reasonably good job. And if I could invent one more thing about Democrats, you know, huge percentage of Democrats don't want Joe Biden to run again. And this is sort of stunning to me. In my view, he's had a success, a more or less successful presidency. Uh, he's handled the war in Ukraine, I think, exceptionally well, finding a fine line between supporting Ukraine without starting a nuclear war. Uh, he's passed a whole bunch of legislation that would stand up to the Obama administration, the Clinton administration. Uh, and he's not been in our faces every day. Uh, and yet Democrats dream of some superhero who's going to come in and make their hearts go a flutter. Um, I'll take a guy who doesn't make my heart go a flutter uh, in this political climate. I've had enough fluttering. Um, Barry asks the perpetual question of American politics on this election, uh, this particular cycle. Now, will a third party emerge from all of this for the next election? Yeah, you always want to bet against that um, because our system is so rigged. I would say a few things make it possible. One, um, there really are more independents in this country now than there are Democrats or Republicans. And it's weird that we don't have that, that we don't have a dem an independent option, partly because independents don't stand for one thing, they stand for a whole bunch of things. But the fact that Kirsten Sinema became an independent, I thought was healthy. There should be independence in Congress. And in her state, there are an awful lot of independents. And it's probably the only way she has a chance of political survival. The second reason why I think it's plausible or possible is there is a group uh, organized called No Labels, which has been raising a lot of money and hiring a lot of lawyers to get a third slot on the national ballots in all, all 50 states. And their theory of the case is maybe this won't be necessary, but if both parties give us a nominee who is unelectable or extreme, then there should be an insurance policy. There should be a chance for other voters to say, okay, those two parties, that's not gonna work for us, but here's a, a, a third way. And you know, you can plausibly see um, uh, a business executive, a former general, somebody who's respected across all sorts of lines, uh, who would be that person. Uh, and uh, uh, No Labels has really done a lot of organizing, raised a ton of money to give the country this insurance policy. If Joe Biden's the nominee, which I assume he will be, I don't really see a lane for that third person. There, there sort of be a moderately centrist, plausible candidate in at least one of the parties. But if Joe Biden decides not to run or whatever, and we get Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump, I think there would definitely be a market for a third, not a third party, but a third candidate. And the no labels people are very clear. We're not organizing a third party. We're just creating a third candidate. During the chaos of the January 6th insurrection, uh, General Milley uh, decided that it was wise to get in touch with his counterpart in China personally, because he was hearing that China was thinking that in the midst of all this, that the US was going to attack China. And the chaos now on Capitol Hill surely must unsettle um, our enemies and our allies around the world. What's your assessment of the damage, however short term, and the uncertainty that this may be creating? Yeah, well, first, um, you know, General Milley is very good at these kind of relationships. And we should be glad when political leaders are loggerheads that the military leaders are in communication to prevent any sort of miscommunication about what's actually going on. And I think he's, he's very good at that. Um, how much this damages the U.S.? The U.S. has been damaged quite a lot over the last five years, and maybe over the last my entire lifetime. But it should be said two things. If you just look at approval of America, who has warm feelings about America? Uh, after that going down so much in the Trump administration, you just look at the polling data, it's going up. So uh, more people around the world are um, feel, having warm feelings about America. It's also true that we um, swore in uh, more new U.S. citizens uh, this year than I think ever before, or it's certainly one of the record years. And so a lot of people still want to come here. And to me, the big political um, story of 2022 and going on into this year 
is that we really began to see the virtues of our system and the weaknesses of autocracy. And we saw it so clearly in Russia, and I hope some people read my newspaper had a devastating inside look at how Russia organized the war in Ukraine. And it really was incompetence on stilts that authoritarian regimes just do not handle information. They tend to breed corruption. And China, which you know looked like a superstar on the rise five years ago, seems to be rigidifying uh, more corruption and their COVID policies um, uh, seem horrific. And so I think the when you solidify power in a single old man, it's just not a recipe for an adaptable system. And Russia and China have gone that way. And it, it's a reminder. And I think the, the rising tide of authoritarianism, both domestically and abroad, has been turned around, at least for now. Uh, and that, to me, is uh, just a tremendous historical shift. Speaking of power and a single old man, Doug is asking a question that several people allude to, which is the fact that Donald Trump's endorsement of McCarthy and the speakership seems not to mean anything. Is Has Trump's grip on the party been loosened? Has he not got the authority that he did? Is anybody afraid of Donald Trump anymore? Yeah, I, I, he has his supporters and people like him, but I, it's been noticeable how much a lot of people um, want to move away from Donald Trump. I was on a plane with a guy who was a big Trump supporter, loved the guy, but he just said, you know, he's got baggage. Let's move on. And I hear that a lot. And so if you look at the polling, you've got a bunch of states now and nationwide where uh, DeSantis, the Florida governor, is out polling Trump. Uh, Trump's positive rating is still very high, but the number of people who want him to be the Republican nominee is plummeting. And more than that, you feel the air going out of the balloon. Uh, he, announces, he announces he's run for president and then does nothing. He's had no rallies. He has no position. He has no staff. Uh, he put out a bunch of online playing cards, uh, which were just pathetic. And so once the aura of Trumpness uh, begins to look weak, um, then I think the party is really ready to, to move along. Uh, you wrote just before Christmas about a crisis of national self-doubt and how Americans are trying to figure who we are, maybe a re-examination of our character and where that puts us in the world. Um, we have Joe Biden who inherited Afghanistan and who had the catastrophic exit, the plan that, uh, uh, that Donald Trump had left orders to get out of Afghanistan. And then you have his successes, uh, the Biden successes in Ukraine, but all of that makes us reassess, what, 70 years after World War II, what kind of country we are are we first among equals? Do we still have a policeman role? And how this is affecting our soul, our sense of ourselves as Americans, which has been that that country on the white horse for decades in the last century. Yeah, well, first, it's a good reminder that when Vladimir Zelensky decided to go to a country for his first trip out of Ukraine, he came to Washington. And it's a reminder that for all we've suffered and for all the world is getting more equal in the rising powers of China and India, uh, the U.S. is still the leader nation. And people want the U.S. to play that leader role. And for the world to have some sense of stability, there has to be a country that really believes in the world order. And so I, I think this the Ukraine war has been a reminder that we haven't slipped maybe as much as we think we have. The second thing I'll say uh, is that Americans are too down on their own country right now in a way that is not merited by the data. So if they think like the country's coming apart in the seams, in some way it is. I, I think we're, we're subjectively very bad off. Uh, high social distrust, uh, a lot of mental health problems, a lot of hatreds, obviously. So if you ask, is America healthy in the way we relate to one another? I would say, no, America is not healthy. But my own belief is that a country can get a lot wrong if it gets the big thing right. And the big thing is unlocking the talent of its people. And I have a friend and an economist at George Mason University, Tyler Cowen, who says, add up all the things that are wrong with America, inequality, political dysfunction, climate change, all the problems we face in one, line, in one row. And then in this row, right, America has more talent than ever before. 
and this row B matters more than this row A. And so if, for example, you take a look at the 1890s, if I had plopped you down in 1893, you would have seen a country with widespread poverty, with unemployment going up to 19%, with oodles of political corruption, uh, with a wave of controversial immigration. And, and a powerful oligarchy too. And a power, yeah, absolutely. And you would have thought this place is coming apart at the seams. Uh, and the, but the 1890s didn't lead to civil war or national breakdown. It led to the American century. And so when you get energy and you have talent and you have people willing to respond to problems, you can solve your problems and you can move forward. And if you look at American innovation, you know, just this week, uh, AI and the vaccines, uh, fusion technology, the space telescope, uh, the innovative machine is still there. We're doing a much better job of educating our people. In the 1890s, education was for white men. And now we educate a wider swath. And as a result, you get to see people taking advantage of their skills. And so, for example, one of the good news stories that I think is undertold is that in 2005, there was a political scientist named Samuel Huntington who wrote a book called Who Are We? And the argument of the book was Hispanics are not moving up the education ladder and the mobility ladder the way other immigrant groups have. You could not write that book today because all the evidence goes the other way. If you look at Hispanic education levels, dropout rates are way down, college enrollments are way up, Hispanics passed whites in 2012 in terms of college attainment, and then as a result, Hispanics have the fastest wage growth, a growth of any large ethnic group. And so that's just one example of how people, how opportunity still does happen here. But we see now the same kind of pushback we saw at the turn of the 19th and 20th century against immigration. In this case, it was Ireland and Eastern Europe back then. Now it's south of the border and elsewhere. And this great replacement theory that has fueled a lot of the, the far, far right of the Republican Party, which in contradiction to everything you just said, is still virulent uh, and embraces a lot of people who felt that this was the white man's country and it's not that way anymore. And they're willing to to fight you about it. Yeah, well, nativism and white supremacy are an ancient American tradition that has been going on forever, but it has not led, for example, to a 1920s style crackdown on immigration. We still have a wide swath of the country, a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans who think immigration is, is good for the country, especially legal immigration. But it is also true that a lot of towns on the Texas border are, are swamped and overwhelmed. And to have a good immigration system, you have to have a good border control. And we do, we do not have that. And those two things are not opposites. They go together. But you do raise something which, to go back to our soul as a country. I think part of the reason the American soul is hurting is because the deaths of despair, uh, the, there's all these weird social statistics that I quote all the time. 54% um, of Americans say no one knows them well. The number of people who have no, say they have no close personal friends has quadrupled. 26% of Americans have a rupture with their own immediate family. They're not talking to somebody in their immediate family. The number of high school students who say they have um, feel despondent or hopeless most of the time is now 45%. And so there is some social immiseration here, a social breakdown where people just don't know how to connect to each other. And that's one cause of the what I think is the problem with the soul of the country. The second is that we're in a transition about what our national narrative. Uh, in the book of Exodus, you know, the Exodus happened in order to be told to unify the Jewish people. God, you know, God said, tell the story before the story actually happened. And the second uh, lesson from Exodus is uh, Rabbi Sachs used to say this, the book of um, the creation of the universe in Genesis is told in um, nine or 10 verses. The creation of the tabernacle in the book of Exodus is hundreds and hundreds of verses, which we've all sat through because relatively boring. So why did so many verses get uh, dedicated to how to build this tabernacle? And Rabbi Sachs would say, it's because the people is held together by two things a common story and a common project. And the Israelites were held together by the project of building that tabernacle. And I would say another thing we struggle with as a country is we, we lack a common story and we lack a common project. 
And the loss of a common story is sad to me because my immigrant ancestors who came over from Ukraine and Latvia, they believed the American story was the Exodus story. We escaped oppression, crossed the wilderness and came to the promised land. The founders wanted to use the Exodus story. They wanted to put Moses on the great seal of the United States. Martin Luther King talked about the Exodus story. And so that was the narrative of America for a lot of years and for a lot of groups. Uh, but if I say to young people, people under 35, America is an Exodus story, they look at me and you are crazy. This is not a land of milk and honey. There's a story, there's a country founded on genocide sustained by white supremacy. So they don't buy that story. And so we have to find another story that includes all the people who are here. And I think we're struggling to do that. Uh, the United States has taken an important role, the lead role in Ukraine. And we heard from President Zelensky invoking a number of American tropes in his address to Congress, which was very wisely and well done on his part. But a lot of people who are watching today want to know, for example, Sid, how, how you see this war ending. Uh, Andrew wants to know about the larger picture of the tide of autocracy in Europe with leaders like the one in Hungary and, and, and how much Ukraine really matters, how long we're willing to make it, to let it matter ourselves and our allies and how it plays a larger role in this kind of um, rising autocracy that we're seeing in places in the world where we might not have expected it before. Yeah, well, well first of all, you know, I was in Dublin on vacation over the summer and I'm, I'm at the passport control line, you know, where they, you're waiting in line to give them, show them the, your passport. And there was an Irish lady with a big personality running the line, telling everybody where to go. And she saw a family in the back, went up to them, had a quick conversation with them and said, everybody step aside, step aside, step aside. These, this family is from Ukraine. These are the most important people in the world right now. They're going to the front of the line. And everybody sort of looked, was admiring or like felt, um, Tremendous gratitude to them. Uh, then the shell-shocked, stare, scary, scared-looking family from Ukraine. Um, but I always remember that these are the most important people in the world right now. And I think that's still true. And if you had told me back then that the, the uh, Western coalition would hold together as well as it has, I maybe wouldn't have believed it. If you had told me Zelensky would go to Congress and basically the body rose as one in support of him. Not a, completely as one, but pretty united. Republicans and Democrats standing and cheering together in a way I haven't seen for a long time. So in my mind, the unity behind Ukraine is still there. I think they're getting more advanced weapons. Russia's running out of munitions. And for a time, the, the uh, I think, U.S. military thought was that we want Ukraine to win, but not too quickly, not in a way that'll scare Putin. Uh, but now, you know, these things are hard to control. And I'm not sure they're going to get 100% of what they want. I'm told by people who know the situation on the ground that there are some Russian positions that it really will be hard to get them out of those positions. But the momentum for the past <clears throat> several months has been on the Ukrainian side. And I think they just know, and I think we should know, they just have to win. They just have to win if we're going to have a, a 21st century that's going to look like a liberal century. And where does it end? In a, a peace deal that keeps a lot of Ukrainian territory in Ukrainian hands or returns it to Ukrainian hands? Yeah, I, I think it would. It may not end soon because why should Ukraine stop when they're on the march? Um, but, uh, I, and, you know, they've set this very hard, hard line position of not being willing to negotiate with Putin. But if things begin to crumble, I, I would imagine that a, a, a negotiated settlement heavily favoring Ukraine would be, would reflect the logic of the facts on the ground. And uh, of course, then it comes the idea of a Marshall Plan for Ukraine to show what we can do when we have to for our allies. Yeah. And, and you know, I do think Europeans have played a, have paid a cost. Um, energy prices, we, they've been helped out by a relatively mild winter so far. Uh, and their governments did a good job. There, there's somebody who said this to me, um, Putin is, we think of it as a mastermind. He's such an idiot. He, he said he was going to embargo Europe. He should have said it in October before the European governments had a chime to do something about it. But he said it months and months before. And so the Europeans spent a lot of time building their stockpiles, finding alternative supplies. And he really made it the, the energy cutoff much less effective than he ha had to. 
And it just shows he's one guy who's not really counts getting the council of advisors. He's isolated and, and just making blunder after blunder. That sounds familiar. <laughs> What uh, with with some more of our questions to go back to the idea of the autocrats on the rise around the world and how certainly maybe what Putin has tried in uh, in Ukraine has given them pause, but they're still there. Viktor Orban in Hungary, perhaps foremost among them in that part of the world. Yeah, no, we're in a moment of global populism uh, and authoritarian populism, and. In some sense, it feels like one big struggle, whether the struggle is against Xi in China or against Putin or, in a, or against Viktor Orban, the Polish uh, ruling party, uh, against Jean-Marie Le Pen in France. Um, it feels like one th struggle, and it's a struggle between diversity and pluralism and liberalism and homogeneity and cultural coherence. And, you know, the... The reason I think these movements have arisen in country after country, uh, and you, 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 we, we sort of gravitate toward America-centric salute explanations for all this. Why are there Trumpians in America? Well, there are Trumpians in America for the same reason there are Viktor Orbanus in, in Hungary, and there are populists in Italy, and there are populists in Sweden. And my main explanation for that is that over the last many decades, highly educated people have gone to college, married each other, had kids, subsidized their kids awesomely so they can get into more competitive colleges. And then when those kids graduate, they move to a very few coastal cities in America, to San Francisco, LA, Washington, New York, Boston. They marry each other and they have kids. And so what you get is an inherited Brahmin class of highly educated people who have a lot of cultural power, who have a lot of economic power, who have a lot of um, political power. And that's like 20% of the country and their wages are just going up and up and up. And then the rest of the 80% of the country, a good share of them say, this is messed up. I'm being left behind. I have no cultural power. I'm being ignored. I'm being condescended to. Uh, and I, I don't want to be like those people, and I rebel. And I think it's it's that phenomenon is happening in Western, in capitalistic country after Western capitalistic country, and we're seeing the revolt of people who have really been left out of the meritocracy. And that's why, in determining who somebody's going to vote for, it's not very telling how much they make. It's extremely telling how much education they have. And that's the most important divide right now. And in country after country, it's the college educated, university educated on one side, the less educated on another. And so we get this class or educational class divide. Uh, and, and you see this in our elected officials, many of whom went to Ivy League schools, but who purport to speak for the little guy in the middle. Well, that, this is the perpetual, this is forever, the, the paradox of... of um, uh, of populism is it's never actually run by populists. <laughs> you know, Josh <laughs> Pauly, Yale, uh, you know, you go down the list, Ted Cruz, Princeton, uh, they, they're all prep school guys who worked at Goldman Sachs. Um, even like George Santos, it struck me like he's trying to be a Trumpian populist. And what does he lie about? He lies to say, you know, I really worked at Goldman Sachs, uh, some populist. Uh, but if it's, they want the credibility of elite institutions, but then they pretend they're just the working yokels. We have several questions about the Supreme Court, and it strikes me that so much of what you were talking about, the, the advancing uh, moral America, was accomplished or, or capped off by Supreme Court decisions on voting rights and matters like that. And now the court seems to be in retreat from some of those at the very moment when the people who stand most to benefit from them, like people of color, are saying, it's our moment, it's our time. Yeah, well, they, um, I, I should say, I cover a lot of things. I don't really write about the court too much. You, you can't know everything about everything. So in order to know something about a few we subjects- We have faith in you, David. <laughs> that I can fake it. Um, you know, the, the, the court has, I mean, it, it's sort of an interesting story. When I was in college, uh, I was asked to debate Milton Friedman on national TV. Uh, and if you go on YouTube and you Google David Brooks, Milton Friedman, 
you'll see a 21 year old me with a great big bushy head of hair and 1980s gigantic glasses that were apparently on loan from the Mount Palomar Lunar Observatory. Uh, and I'm debating Friedman and he's destroying me. But it wasn't bad enough that I had to debate, conser I was then a socialist, that I had to debate conservative Milton Friedman. Three founders of this thing called the Federalist Society uh, were also on his side on the program. And when I think back to what those three people did, really create uh, an intellectual movement uh, gradually through the law schools and through the institutions, and now really with a dominant grip on the Supreme Court, it's an astonishing story of how to do social change. And whether you like it or not, it's very impressive what they did. And there are some decisions that I like, some that I don't, um, but uh, I'm not qualified to talk about the merits of each decision. I'm just not qualified, but I sort of admire the way a movement over generations did what they wanted to do, basically. But, but the decisions do bleed over into things that you do write about, which is political. And we do have now vehement divisions, not only over things like gun rights, but now abortion as a consequence of a court decision that will, will play out in the social culture and in politics. Yeah. Let me talk about Dobbs. Um, you know, I um, have moved gradually over the course of my life um, from being pretty ardently pro-choice to being a little more pro-life. Uh, but I'm where a lot of Americans are. Uh, I don't know when life begins. I don't think it begins at conception. I don't think it begins on the day of birth. <laughs> I think it's somewhere in the middle there. And so, you know, when I look at a sonogram, uh, when I look at mothers and fathers who've lost a, a child to miscarriage, uh, when I look at the brain science of what we know about fetal development, Somewhere to me, 15 to 22 weeks, what we might call insolment happens. And I've always thought that if we could solve this problem politically and have debates and legislature, um, we would get to what the clear majority in this country thinks, which is what I just said, that we shouldn't make abortion illegal, but we shouldn't make it a nine-month possibility. Uh, and... That's somewhat happening and somewhat not happening. The country has definitely been where it was, looking for the middle ground. We are now entering a regime, though, where we have some states going all the way to zero and some states going to nine months. And so in some sense, democracy is not working, uh, at least in representing the views of the majority, because some states are red and some states are blue. And in each of those cases, the parties are controlled by somebody who wants an absolute solution. Well, so we'll go from that to an easy one, which is the Mideast, starting with Israel. Yesterday, uh, yesterday, Foreign Affairs Magazine's headline was Israel gets its most right-wing government in history. And of course, what happens in Israel has ripple effects across the world. Question of whether Israel is going to sustain support for Ukraine being one of them, the relationship with the United States and with the West Bank being among the others. So let's start there and figure out what you think the consequences will be of this election of Netanyahu is back. Yeah, I, I, here, well, first of all, it, you know, it's when I when I was a foreign correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, I covered Israel most intensely um, in the 90s. And that was the days of the Oslo peace process. And that was the days when you thought Israel was going to be Tel Aviv. <laughs> Uh, and that was the days when you visited Jerusalem and it looked kind of like Tel Aviv. And that's all changed. Uh, you go to Jerusalem now, it's definitely not Tel Aviv. Um, and so the rise of ultra-Orthodoxy, um, the rise of what is now the right wing of the, uh, the, the Netanyahu government, and the way the entire political culture has shifted rightward over these decades is really astounding. And partly it's because of the failure of the peace process. Barack, Ehud Barak offers land for peace and you get the intifada and so the left collapses, that's part of it. But the second more interesting thing to me, and again, this is part of a global trend, is the rise of what you might call, if you wanna be polite about it, you'd call it cultural coherence. That some of the ultra-Orthodox parties, they want what some of the extreme American evangelicals want. They just want cultural coherence, not pluralism, but everybody under the same tent and unity. 
that'd be the polite way to say it. The impolite way to say it is just intolerance. And for some reason, there's something in modern culture. There's something about a culture in which identity is all over the place, where being trans is, is a respected thing in many parts of society, uh, where racial diversity is as never before, that some people just find that the chaos and road to destruction and they lead they lead into their identitarian identity and they lead into a kind of nationalism that gives them on the one hand a feeling of belonging but on the other hand great aggression because they know what they stand for some imagined version of what their country is some imagined version of israel and so to me the netanyahu government is not as much a political problem it's a cultural problem and it's a religious problem and it's a spiritual problem for a country that was once quite liberal, quite willing to embrace diversity, a, a country where people are coming from Iraq and Russia and, and America and all these places now hardening into um, something that feels much more pre-industrial or, or Middle Eastern. And, and how does that play out in U.S. relations with Israel? We've been here before, right? You know, Bibi says, he, yeah, I'm going to manage these people. I don't think he's the same Bibi he was. Um, you know, I think he's become one of these people. And there are just going to be some foundational differences, not necessarily over politics or over how to deal with the Palestinians or, or how to do the peace process or what to do with Iran. But uh, we, Israel and the United States, had and I should say Israeli Jews and American Jews, had just an, a, un, you didn't have to think about it, there was a fraternal sense. And I wonder if that's gonna go away. I mean, my kid, um, my oldest son served in the IDF about, I don't know, five, six years ago now, uh, for about a three or four year period. And he blended right in. He, there was not any sense that he was part of some Western cosmopolitan American thing. He, he was. He fought with his comrades there and the IDF, and it was not a problem. But you wonder if Israel moves um, and if the armed forces become more ultra-Orthodox, um, if those rifts, or even any of us who go to Israel, it begins to feel more and more like a foreign country. That I think that's, I, I worry about the underlying cultural trends as much as whatever the Netanyahu government's going to do. Apart from Israel, we have our dealings with Iran, which you know certainly over the past administration versus this one have changed uh, considerably, but the problems of Iran remain with an active, young, educated population that essentially has a dead-end country to deal with. And we've seen the outpourings and the protests and the, um, the vicious reactions and the executions that Iran has carried out to essentially tell people, you're not going to get away with this. But Iran isn't going to get away with this forever, with this totalitarian imposition. Yeah. Um, first, I um, I think I'm sort of glad, I guess. I, when Obama signed the deal with Iran, I was sort of for it. Then when I didn't think we should get rid of it, or I, I was against it, and then I didn't think we should get rid of it, which Trump did. Now I'm sort of glad the Biden administration has sort of given up, I think, on the deal that uh, it's just not in the cards. And as for what's going on inside Iran, I asked two Iran experts over the last couple of weeks, is this just a bunch of educated young people who want to watch, you know, Ted Lasso on TV? Is this just a revolt against uh, by those kinds of people or is this something different? And in both cases, they were quite clear that this is something different. This is not just a few highly educated people who are um, who are, you know, marching so they can you know, wear bikinis or something like that. Uh, this is a broad-based uh, popular uprising against a decrepit regime. And to go back to a point I made earlier, it's yet another sign that liberal democracies for all their problems adapt and they change. And authoritarian governments as they age tend to crumble. And I have no crystal ball to see how this ends, but you do sense the crumbling. Uh, and you sense it in people who are feeling um, just disgusted. And as somebody who covered the end of the Soviet Union, things really change when a regime can no longer count on its troops to do what Iran still can't count on its troops, 
which is to kill people. And at the end of the Soviet Union, the Russian soldiers, the whole Russian apparatus did not have enough morale or belief in the Soviet system that they were willing to kill other Russians. Now, it may be the Iranian regime still has enough uh, morale that it, it can kill people who want to change it. But I wonder, that, that can go away. Well, that happened in 1917 in Russia when you know, in the Russian capital, the troops refused to, to fire on or to kill Russians. Right. Uh, yeah. it's, it's always the tip of a spear, and you're wondering what what will the spear tip be? Say for Putin, will this be it? Um, what will it be for Iran? Will it be the protests over the death of this young woman? Yeah, and, and it's a, a reminder of something else we talked about earlier, which is the minorities really can play the decisive role here. The majority can sit back, and they they are not actors, but an organized minor, minority. Uh, can really turn things if they if they really believe in their cause, which of course was 1917. Uh, and as for coming home to domestic politics, because we seem to have endless elections now, there never seems to be a break. Um, the things that come to the surface as the issues that people are fighting over in elections are like maybe those protests in Iran. They're about something bigger, but they never get to the bigger thing. Are we going to be fighting over issues that are not really minor, but which are telling, which are signifiers of the larger disputes and divisions and angst in the country? Yeah, I mean, I, as I say, I think, you know, we have the same divides that countries around the world have. We are divided between the educated and less educated, between the urban and the rural, um, between the industrial and the information age. And then we try to find, a, but it's all one war. And the battleground of the war can change, uh, but it's all one war. And so some days we'll be talking about transgender bathrooms or drag queen story hour, or CRT. Um, but somehow these seem less like people mobilizing on this issue. It's they're mobilizing on a larger war. And the, the war has these underlying issues, which I don't think any of us have really gotten to the bottom of. Uh, and some of it, as I say, is about diversity. Some of it is about cosmopolitanism. Some of it is about a vision of a society in which, um, for those on the right, where autonomy and individualism is not as important as um, collective coherence. Order. Uh, order, basically. And, and so if you really scratch an evangelical, I don't think the evangelical support for Trump has anything to do with Christianity. I think it has, it's nationalist. It's just a, a, a sense of a feeling of threat and the rise of nationalism and huge numbers of evangelicals who support Trump never darken a church door. That's just not what they're into, but they call themselves evangelical because it becomes part of the label of what, who us are. And Carrie Lake, when she was running in Arizona for governor, played up all this Christian identity stuff not, I don't know if everyone was a believer, but it was a way to mark who we are. And so it's it's like one identity off another. And then we have a lot of little battles, uh, which are like the epiphenomenon of these basic identity conflicts. We've had several questions kind of on this topic. Uh, Elon Musk has been front and center in many discussions in the last weeks and about Twitter, which again, representing a larger sense of social media and its role in the country and the reactions in Congress. We need to do something about social media. We need to change the uh, the 1990s order that kind of gave it gave social media a free reign. Um, but, but to what extent are social media responsible for the sense of anime, anime that you discussed and our sense of being isolated, even though on a computer screen and pixels, we've supposedly never been more um, connected? Yeah, well, we, evolved to have deep communication, like real conversations. And uh, on online and social media, whether it's, you know, Instagram or whatever, um, it's, it's not communication, it's distraction. And it's not understanding, there's understanding nowhere and judgment everywhere. And so it's a fundamentally, we just didn't evolve to have this kind of shallow communication. I think that's one of the reasons uh, society is so fractured. And then we just spend a lot more time alone. Uh, if you measure how many time people spend with friends, since 2012, it's gone down massively. 
And 2012 is about when the smartphone comes out. So that's got to be a technology story. And so if you ask me, why are we so fractured as a society? Why are we fighting? Why do we hate each other? Why are we so lonely? Why are we so hateful? Why are we so sad? I think the technology story is a big piece of it, but I don't think it's the only story. I think there are other stories you could tell. Uh, we become much more diverse and it's, it's just more socially challenging to have people who are radically unlike you living right next to you. Well, and, even comes, I'm so sorry. Well, I think, you know, I love diversity and I love, but it's just something that it makes it a little harder. And then I'll say the one final thing, which I think is underplayed is moral formation. It used to be in American society from the founders up until World War II. The founders said, you know, they looked around their fellow Americans and they said, these people are kind of screwed up. <laughs> we need to make them into better people. You can't survive as a country unless you're trained people to be better, less selfish, more other concerned, more effectively compassionate and caring toward each other. And so all across American societies, there were all these institutions that taught people how to be, how to be a little less selfish. And there were things like the Sunday school movement, the YMCA, Hebrew schools, synagogues, churches, schools, clubs, service clubs, service clubs, and schools themselves thought our job is not to make somebody into a, a doctor. Our job is to make them into a good person. There's a school in, called the Stowe School in Vermont in the 20s. The headmaster said, I try to make students who are uh, acceptable at a dance, invaluable at a shipwreck. And that's about character. And over the last 50 years, our institution after institution has gotten out of the moral formation business. And as a result, in my view, people are ill-equipped to be kind to each other. They're ill-equipped to know how to basic skills. How do you have a conversation? How do you build a friendship? How do you break up with someone without destroying their heart? These are important practical skills that, in my view, we have not passed on to this generation. So, of course, they have trouble with some of the difficult things that happen in social life. I think if we could see our audience, we'd see thousands of heads nodding in agreement on that particular one. Um, we do want to be able to go out with something optimistic. So maybe you can help us do that. And if you had any New Year's predictions that you're still clinging to, I'm sure people would like to hear that too. I haven't even kept my New Year's resolution so far. So. <laughs> what have you broken already? No, I have I have managed to get my steps in. It's to me it's about <laughs> steps. Um, you know, I do think um, fundamentally, I think America is not on the wrong track. I know that everyone says America is on the wrong track. I think we in the media have developed a worse bad news bias. We always had kind of a bad news bias. But now on the internet, when we're watching um, for uh, clicks and how many Doom pages. Scrolling. Yeah. And so we, if you look at the number of headlines that are meant to evoke anger and fear, over the last 20 years, the share of those headlines that are negative, scary, and, and infuriating is up by 100 or 150 percent. We're just way more negative. And the things we don't pay attention to are some of the technological innovations that I've talked about, some of the trends like the rise in Hispanic wages and education levels that I talked about, uh, the rising wages of Americans. And so we did have a period of wage stagnation in the 70s and 80s, but it has not been stagnant for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, wages have been going up. And after social insurance policies, wages for the bottom fifth have been going up quite well. Inequality has been dropping, and Obama does not get enough credit for this. But a lot of his policies put in place have really reduced the inequality gap. Uh, and so you can look at a lot of positive trends. Uh, and But if you say them, then, oh, you're ignoring all the bad trends. I'm not ignoring the bad trends. I'm just saying the positive innovation and change uh, is out there. And I'll f leave you with one final statistic. Some economists put together a basket of commodities that um, you, you know, are the basis for a middle-class lifestyle, energy, food, whatever. The, the amount of time the average American has to work to earn those commodities has gone down by 72%. And so time is the ultimate commodity, but they're not making any more of it. But if I can go through my day and have to work less time to afford food for my family, less time uh, to afford light in the house or air conditioning, then I have more time to do anything else. 
And we have just got to, you think, you know, we have ATMs now. That saves a lot of time. I love ATMs. Uh, and so, you know, people used to spend hours and hours a day on drudgery. And now we don't have to do that anymore. We've got washing machines. Uh, and so to me, that time bonus has made our lives so much better. We don't always know what to do with our time, but that's on us. <laughs> I think it's a sign of progress. David Brooks, happy to hear something hopeful. Maybe that's a good launch point for the next time we have a conversation here. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. We want to remind everyone that next week, Larry Mantle will be talking about China and the challenge to autocracies, just the kind of subject you heard David Brooks mentioning here for a few minutes in our wide-ranging discussion this evening. I hope you can all join us then for that. Thank you again. Thank you to all of the sponsors and supporters of this program and to you, the audience. I'm Pat Morrison. Thank you for being here.